It was the first time I had heard a message that felt like home. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is on healing from trauma and rebuilding your life on stronger foundations. And we also touch on creativity and purpose. Our guest today is Anne Lin, also known as the creator behind Girl and the Word. This is actually Anne's second time on the podcast. The first time she was on was episode 143, and that one was called How to Become a Successful Content Creator. So now Anne is back, and she's back to talk about a more personal and deeper topic, and also share about her new book, Forever Home. Anne Lin is an interior stylist and the author of the new Christian nonfiction, Forever Home, moving beyond brokenness to build a strong and beautiful life. She currently lives with her husband and Corgi in a renovated fixer-upper. Hello, Anne. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. I'm so happy you're here. First of all, congrats on your new book. I I loved it and I'm so (laughs) proud of you. Aw, thank you. You were one of the few kind people who provided a word of endorsement. So I really appreciated you reading it early and giving me that kind word in the book. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So for those listening who missed your last episode with us, why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yes. So I am now an author, but um, you can find me on YouTube, on Instagram, doing home makeovers um, and talking about my faith and mental health um, issues and wellness and things like that. Okay. So you're creative in so many ways. Like you have your DIYs, you have YouTube, you have your book and and you you paint, you just do so much. (laughs) What would you say is the common thread between everything you do and also relating to what you think your mission and purpose is? Wow. That's a great question. You know, for a lot of creatives, I feel like that is the Um, kind of dilemma where they have so many interests and they don't know how to pull it all together. And I was the exact same way because I grew up wanting to be an artist, but also wanting to be a teacher and wanting to be a writer and a singer and all these things. You can do it all too. (laughs) Oh no, I, it's like a jack of all trades kind Mm -hmm. of thing, master of none. But I think what really gave me purpose was when I encountered Christ and having this personal faith that permeated every aspect of my life, it gave me inspiration in all of the creative areas that were once so fragmented from each other. So now I have this purpose, this pull and reason to create and do the things that bring me joy. And because it also glorifies the God that I serve and the God that I love. So, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, tell us a little bit more about that because I know it, yeah, that makes sense in the big picture, but on the real, on the surface level, you have so many ideas and projects. How do you decide what, what to do and how, to, where to put your energy? Do you just let your energy follow? You just follow the flow? Like what happens? You know, sometimes it helps to follow the flow, but other other times. I think it's good to have a big picture in mind. And the good news is that a lot of creatives are good at big picture thinking. So kind of utilize that skill set to outline the year beforehand, you know, like your top goals for the year and what you want to accomplish with the time that you have. And with that kind of big picture outline, then you can break it down month to month and see what you should be pouring your time into. Um, If we just flow all the time, I feel like um, with me as like kind of a planner and a perfectionist or a recovering perfectionist, I should say, when it's not, I guess, purposeful or what I deem to be purposeful, I feel kind of aimless doing it and it doesn't bring me as much joy. So having that outline of the year and the monthly goals allows me to be free and have that creative freedom and yet still um, work towards, you know, accomplishing that thing that I feel is most important. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, anyone who does something creative related to their career, I feel like sometimes that creativity does feel like work. And so how do you have a separate, uh, like a divider between what is work creativity and what is like, just for me, hobby creativity? Like how, how do you separate your life? Does it, does it work like that? 
It does. It does. And maybe for me, it's a little more black and white than a lot of other creatives would be. But for me, if it's truly for my own edification, I just simply don't film it. Mm -hmm. I love that. (laughs) It's as simple as that. Just don't put it out there for people to follow the process. Let it be for me um, or for my quiet time and and self-edification. And that way it doesn't feel like you know, it's like a performance. That way it's truly an authentic creative expression. Yeah. Are there hobbies that you lean most towards for yourself that you don't share with others? (laughs) You know, that is hard. I do tend to share a lot. Um, But I think when I'm by myself and I find myself just depleted and needing to recharge, I read a lot. Mm. And I feel like that's when I take in inspiration rather than constantly giving out inspiration. Um, And that's when I learn how to be a better writer as well and um, just a better storyteller. So I feel like reading really enriches my entire soul. (laughs) Right. Okay, so let's talk about your new book. I mean, first of all, tell us what is it about? So the book is called Forever Home, Moving Beyond Brokenness to Build a Strong and Beautiful Life. And it basically just helps you better recognize and understand when you're being triggered so you can uproot the things that are holding you back, um, things like trauma and and painful um, parts of your past. So in it, I show you ways in which you could move forward from this trauma by building these beautiful spaces, both internally and externally in your life. And I always tell people that it begins with this deconstruction process, right? I know that you guys have been in a renovation uh, for the past, like this entire year, pretty much. Um, So this might resonate with you. But when you first tear down the house, it might seem so totally beyond repair. Like you're walking in the space that you bought, but now it looks like like a natural disaster occurred in here. And you're like, wow, I can't imagine it being better than this because it's so dirty and it's so like broken. But even though at first this deconstruction process of your character and of your soul might feel like a teardown, it's only when you demolish the old can you actually rebuild something new and better. And that's when I talk about how to create this new foundation of your life that's based on God's love um, and being more securely attached to your Heavenly Father. It really gives us this, this unshakable foundation in which we can build a more solid Uh, life upon that when the storms of life hit our house or our life won't fall apart, but it could withstand those adversities when we are, you know, built on something solid that we can rely on and so on and so forth. So I kind of use that metaphor of like building a house from scratch um, as a way to um, show how you can build your new life after trauma. Yeah. And I mean, the next question is like, why did you feel like you wanted to share this book with the world? What, what about the timing? And cause I also know you were going through renovation at, yep. at the time you're <laughs> writing this. So yeah. Tell us about why you wanted to write this book at that time. Oh yeah. It was definitely top of mind the whole renovation process because I was building this little house like that I had just bought and writing this book. And I was working on like two babies pretty Mm -hmm. much. Those are two Um, big projects at the same time. And I know you were designing the house. You were doing a lot. (laughs) Yeah. It was a lot of firsts for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of just figuring it out as we go. Um, and I think the reason why I needed to write about this, um, this whole, having a home and and that kind of stability was because I moved so many times my entire life. I moved like 14 times total, I think. Oh, I know. Oh it was just, I know. It was a constant like state of transition for me. And um, learning how to start over again and adapting to that was pivotal to survival if, ever since I was um, five. That was the first time we moved from Vietnam to the States. So. I had to learn how to, you know, learn how to adapt and kind of flow with the changes. But what I didn't realize through all of those transitions was that every time I had to adapt to a change, 
um, it left a scar in me that I didn't know was there. And before I knew it, I was just constantly anxious, very pessimistic, thinking, oh, you know, things are good now, but when's it gonna be bad again, you know, and having just kind of like that traumatized mindset of, I can't rest because I never know when I'm going to have to be in survival mode again. And now that, I mean, not now, in 2021, when I was um, writing this book and also renovating this house, I realized, wow, this is the first time in my life where I had a measure of control over my physical stability, my, my physical environment, where I wouldn't have to move again if I didn't want to, or if something, you know, unforeseen didn't happen. And it kind of shook me a little bit. Um, I was really afraid of having something to lose. And I didn't know how to sustain a peaceful mindset which ironically is what my channel is all about. Yeah. And yeah, and so I kind of enrolled myself in trauma therapy while writing this book and renovating this home so I can have a deeper understanding of like my insecurities and my fears and um, triggers and things like that. And uh, I will say that was a very intense <laughs> process. Um, trauma therapy is very different from just normal talk therapy. It has a lot to do with unlodging the trauma that was embedded in your body. So it's a lot of, um, you know, that kind of like mm -hmm. visceral feelings of unloading. And every time you walk out of a session, you literally feel as though you, you've been through like an emotional autopsy. Like you wow. feel so vulnerable and exposed and at the same time grateful because now you're like, wow, I've inspected wounds. I didn't even know were there. And having all of that um, really helped me to find purpose in writing this book where I can share my findings and my research and my personal story and examples of how I unearth the things that life has, you know, broken within me and how I allowed God to shine a light on it and then truly heal it. Um, and not just sweep it under this cosmic carpet. I think that's so amazing. And it's so crazy to think you were doing all those three things at the same time, <laughs> like the therapy writing and house. Um, oh you my also, gosh. You, you get very vulnerable in this book. Like you tell your life story, you talk about your family, you talk about your trauma. And I, I felt... I think it's so brave and it's also like, it makes the reader connect with you in such a deep way. So if you're open to it, like, I'd like for you to share a little bit more about your story because the people listening have not read your book yet. They don't know that side of you. Also, you mentioned your persona online is very peaceful. It's all about aesthetic and calm and it is beautiful, but it, I don't think people recognize what's underneath. And, and the reason why you're trying to be so calm is because of the turbulence within. Please share a little bit more. Also, because I know people listening might have similar experiences, right? Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, right off the bat, when you read the introduction um, called The Demolition, you get a glimpse into one of the darkest memories of my past, um, which was when I had, I guess, met the love of my life at that point. Um, I was like, 14, he was 16. So we were both like young and stupid and without guidance. And also both came from very, you know, broken families and things. But he had like really swept me off my feet. I felt like I had no one else to turn to at that point except for him. And so it was just the perfect storm. Um, for someone who is prone to manipulating and is someone who is vulnerable and, and needs somebody there. So we got together and I was madly, deeply in love. He like love bombed me with all of these grand gestures of affection. And I would have done anything for this kid. But I remember like probably a year or something, or I forgot how long, but about like a year into our relationship, something changed. Like he had like a shift in his attitude toward me. It was no longer gentle. It was very abrasive and short and I guess like demanding and 
irritated all the time. And so uh, I didn't know any better back then. I had no one to kind of guide me through it. So I just thought, oh no, you know, what am I doing wrong? Like that setting him off. Like, why is he raging at me for not wearing makeup? Not understanding that all of these like things are toxic and manipulative and abusive. Um, I didn't know the signs. And so I just kind of fixed myself and did my best to, you know, earn his love and affection and just chase after that carrot on a stick up until prom night when he got on a call with somebody. And I just had this like pit in my stomach, like this feeling of, oh, I feel like he's talking to another girl, you know? Um, And so I started crying and his friend approached me and said, hey, are you okay? Because I'm crying in the corner (laughs) on, you know, prom night. And then without even asking for any context, he just grabbed me by my wrist, dragged me out of the, the house party, dragged me down to the dark street, the end of the dark street, and just physically abused me. And I was so confused and shattered. And I felt like everything that I knew to be true about people was wrong. Um, And I felt like there was nothing, no one I can trust and and nothing to make it better. And at this point, um, I, I was just thrust into like a deep depression being an antsy teenager that I was. And so every weekend, I guess, after that, Fridays and Saturdays, I would just trash myself at any parties that I could find. And I would engage in all of these substance substances and numb myself. And I remember a certain time that I did that. I was so numb. I couldn't even feel the weather around me. I was like on all sorts of things. Um, it's crazy the things that kids could get their hands on. But uh, I remember stumbling into a stranger's car and then the car filling up with all of my friends. And then they just took off into the night. And then they started blasting really loud techno music. And I was just sitting there in the back seat, feeling so empty and just having this come to myself moment where I realized nobody truly loves you. And it like, hit me like a ton of bricks and I started sobbing, but nobody noticed because everyone's like messed up. And then just as quickly as I had that thought, I saw in my mind's eye a painting of Jesus that my mom uh, erected in our childhood homes. And it was seeing that upon seeing that painting that I felt like comfort washing over me from the top of my head, cloaking my arms down to my toes. Um, and it, it was a very visceral, comforting experience that I had never had before. And keep in mind, I wanted nothing to do with God at that time, nothing to do with religion or anything like that. But that really piqued my interest as to why then, like, why did I see that image then? And honestly, it could have been like an image of, it was like one of those generic Catholic paintings. It could have been any white guy, you know, but I knew the symbolism. And that following school day, I contacted uh, the only Christian friend I knew. And she got like super giddy when I told her the story. And she took me to her family church. Um, And her brother was preaching that Sunday. And I just fell to my knees and gave my life to Christ because it was the first time I had heard a message that felt like home, like really made sense to every fiber of my being, like why they're suffering, why I had to go through it and how I can possibly heal from it. I mean, it was just so, yeah, it felt like coming home. Um, And that's not to say, you know, after that experience and I have Jesus and everything's perfect, far from it. I still had a lot of therapy to do and a lot of unearthing and healing to do up until now, you know, it's a constant process, but at least I had that new foundation that I can build everything else upon. And that new found love and um, attachment to, to a higher being really allowed me to weather those dark nights of the soul that I otherwise could not have.
Yeah, it's like you found hope in that moment. Absolutely. And, and more of a reason to keep going. Exactly. Reason. Yeah. I, I've always been a pretty like existential person. So honestly, without like a deeper reason or purpose, I feel extremely demotivated and empty and I just can't get myself to do anything. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for sharing that story and going deep. And I love that you brought it into that, like come to Jesus moment. Mm-hmm. Story. <laughs> so mm-hmm. you then talk about a lot of the things you learned from therapy, a lot of like you give a lot of like tips on how to heal from your own trauma. So what are the biggest things that you, you have learned that have worked for you, the the ways that have helped you heal? When we find ourselves triggered, usually it's already too late to respond because you, you can't think straight when you're triggered, your frontal lobe literally shuts down the, the part that allows you to have sound judgment stops working um, so that you could survive. So once you're triggered, it's usually already too late. So what can you do to kind of um, dull these triggers or like prepare for them, right? I think, first of all, it's a personal responsibility to seek trauma therapy and things like EMDR or IFS. I know these are a lot of like new acronyms for people, um, but these methods have truly, truly helped me to, I guess, dull the effects of the triggers that I once had in a way where talk therapy never could have. So like EMDR, it, it's, uh, I'm, I don't want to butcher it, but I think it's I, wait, EM, I movement, desensitization, reprocessing. <laughs> and what does that mean? What does it entail? Wow. How do I even say this? There are different methods, but um, the method that I went through was not so much about the eye movements as much as it was um, pulsates, like pulsating um, gadgets in my uh, in my hands. So all it is, is you're reprocessing, reprocessing a specific memory that haunts you to this day while engaging in some sort of rhythmic activity. So The original method is to just follow a finger looking back and forth and you're not getting hypnotized. You're literally just just looking back and forth. And that eye movement actually tricks your brain into doing the same things that it would do when you're in REM sleep. So when we hit REM, we actually reprocess a lot of the activities that we did throughout that day. And we file away memories that could have been traumatic for us. But so many traumatized people can't have a deep sleep. So what happens is that all of those hurtful memories get lodged in in their bodies and the brain is not able to file it away as a thing of the past. So whenever they get triggered, they behave and feel as though they are reliving the same trauma over again. So yeah, what happens is that when people are triggered, they feel as if they're reliving the same trauma all over again in real time. But when you go through EMDR, you allow your frontal lobe, the part that is creative, that controls judgment, abstract thinking, and controls your sense of time. You allow that part to be active while you're working through a painful memory. So your brain is practicing how to file it away as something of the past so that when the trigger happens again, it doesn't feel as urgent or immediate. It doesn't feel as though you are reliving it again. And what a lot of people who have gone through EMDR experience is that they feel as though it's no longer like a, a, an issue. Like they, they go, oh, that it's over with, you know, and that could have never happened (laughs) before. Like before they have all of the physical manifestations of someone who is very like anxious and bothered whenever the trigger occurs. But then after EMDR, they feel as though, oh, it's like, yeah, that happened, but it, it, it's in the past. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting Interesting. experience. Um, So that's one of the few things that I, I experienced that I highly recommend. But if, you know, trauma therapy is not within your budget right now, which I completely understand. Sometimes the best thing you can do is to just take a pause. Um, And that could make a difference between, 
ruining an entire relationship or, you know, making a complete scene and allowing yourself to breathe and, and reactivate that part of your brain that shut down. So I included a lot of breathing techniques that helped me. And one of it, one of which is called the box breathing, where it's, you visualize a box where you um, inhale for four counts and then you hold for four counts and then you breathe out for four counts and then you just repeat it. And that really helps to oxygenate your brain, fill your lungs in with air and, and just allow you to, to have a chance at regulating again. Yeah. 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 Cause I, I know a lot of people have, and people have varying levels of this kind of anxiety. Cause I think it comes from when in whatever you experience in your childhood, you may have felt unsafe. And that gives you that, like that, that tendency to want to control everything. People who want to be perfectionists, right? Just all of those things. So after going through trauma, how have you changed? Like, is it like, I don't know, tell us about the growth and the, the learnings that you've gotten, like reflecting on how you grew up and how you see things now. Absolutely. I feel like we tend to talk a lot about the um, negative effects of trauma, which I'm not saying, you know, like it's so worth it, go through it. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Um, but there's also this, this phenomenon called post-traumatic growth or post-traumatic wisdom. And I feel like that is kind of the wisdom of age that people talk about, that the older you get, the, the wiser you become. And it's because of these, how you grow from these painful experiences that allows you to have these nuggets of wisdom that you can pass on to the next generation. And we all have a story. I don't think that my story is that crazy or unique compared to another's. The whole point of sharing it, though, is the post-traumatic wisdom that I received that hopefully could be a survival guide for others out there. And how you get from a point of being traumatized to using this trauma as um, references for your, you know, like guidance of others is by first surrounding yourself with a supportive and trauma-informed community. It doesn't matter what that community is, whether it's AA or church or friends or family, whichever community that you can find that truly loves you and supports you and shows you that they care for you. I mean, that is probably the most important aspect of healing. Um, we simply don't heal in isolation. And you'll see that phrase like repeated over and over again in my book, um, because every study that I found, every expert that I've talked to has all concluded that people need to be in community if they were to want to be joyous and happy and fulfilled or want to heal from something painful in their past. So it's not easy to find community, but I've also included some contacts at the end of the book that could hopefully help those out there who are more isolated. And the second part is to also find a mentor or someone who could walk with you through this process. Um, a lot of us, for a lot of us, I guess it's uh, our therapist. Um, but if that's not within your budget, you can literally find a friend or ask a teacher, literally anybody who you could trust um, to gently walk you through this process. And the third is to, once you have those two things, community and someone to walk you through it, it should allow you to um, do away with this victim mindset and um, break out of the, oh, this is just who I am. And, you know, that whole, like, um, I guess, mindset that we convince ourselves in and break out of that and truly b believe that you can become someone who you've always wanted to be, a healed and whole person, someone who is not chained by their reactions and not a slave to their mood swings, you know? But yeah, I, I, I truly believe that with this whole like believe, belong, become kind of process, we can all earn a more secure attachment and a more, how do I put it? Like, uh, I guess just a more 
healed perspective and a more abundant perspective on life. Let's talk about your relationship because I think a lot of the trauma shows up in your relationships with other people and that shows in your story that you told with your first boyfriend in high school. So going through this healing process with your husband, what have you learned and how, you know, you you talk about the different attachment styles in your book and you talk about like, you know, everyone's trying to move towards the healed version. So like, tell us what, what have you learned in that process? Wow. Marriage is truly like um, having a mirror in front of you, a mirror that exposes (laughs) all of the sides of you. Yeah. Like um, sometimes it shows you sides that you've never appreciated. And other times it shows you sides that are really, really not pleasant to look at. And I didn't realize how intimate and high stakes um, a marriage is was until I was actually in it. You could read about marriage and you could read about being a parent all you want, but until you're actually like in the car and driving, like it doesn't really hit you, I feel. So it hit me once I was already in the marriage. And once things were already kind of like, I guess, higher stakes and, and, and more tense, that's also why I put myself to trauma therapy. Because I was like, why? Why am I reacting in ways that my 16 year old self would, or like my seven year old self would, why am I not acting my age anymore? I feel like when we were dating, I was a lot more regulated, but like, why Mm. now? You know? Mm. And so like something brought it out of you, like after marriage. For sure. For sure. And it's just that constant being with somebody, I think, that really brought it out of me. Because when you're around somebody for 24-7, I guess you really have to face your fears a lot. And you have to face the things that annoy you or scare you. And, And one of those things is, for me, was feeling trapped. And I didn't realize I was so heavily triggered by that feeling until I was just beside myself, like every week I was like, why am I feeling so? And then one day I just said trapped. And then I was like, Oh yeah, that is the word. (laughs) That is the word for it. And so I brought that to my therapist and we traced it back to a memory that I thought was so commonplace. I thought it was just so normal. And I didn't even think twice about it. And lo and behold, it was that exact memory of my parents fighting like above me, me being so short and them just like going at each other that I felt absolutely trapped. Like, cause I was, I mean, where, where was I supposed to go? I was like, I was so young and that part of me was never healed. I just shoved her into the back of my mind and, and made her grow up, but she never did. And so now whenever I sense relational tension that little part of me is like, oh my gosh, there's nowhere we can hide. Like we are forever trapped in this, you know, terrible place. But going through IFS, which is internal family systems, you you get to talk to each of your inner children. I actually envision myself going back into that same decrepit house, seeing my parents fight and just ignoring them and going straight to her and I remember envisioning kneeling to her level and just hugging her. And then we're both crying together. And I I said, you know, we're going to get through this. You're going to, you're going to get out of this house. We all are. And we're going to make sure that we protect each other. Like I I just assured her that, you know, I'm going to protect her. God's going to protect her and, you know, everything's going to be okay. But I remember still not wanting to leave that memory. Like I didn't want to leave that house when, when I was reprocessing and our session was like (laughs) coming to an end. I remember just feeling so heartbroken to leave her in that house until things got better. But as I was envisioning myself leaving, I remember zooming out of that memory and in the, in the right corner of my eye, seeing the altar of Jesus that I saw when I was saved in the back in the back of that car and seeing that altar and my mind just did it like a whoop 
like a complete circle where I was able to make like this connection I never made before during EMDR. I was like, oh my God. It's almost as if God was saying, hey, I know that you don't want to leave her, but I've been with her this whole time. I have followed her from house to house and I am in this house with her and I am going to save her one day. Uh, and I, I think that just completely, whew, it, it completely um, eradicated that feeling of being trapped. And ever since I reprocessed that memory, me and my husband have been so much more at peace and able to work through our issues without me, you know, acting like a seven-year-old every time. So yeah, that was a big one, feeling trapped and learning where that came from and how to break out of that. Thank you for sharing that because I think it, it also shines light on the fact like on how other people listening can reflect on their own traumas. Cause the way we react, like the immediate emotions that come up when we're triggered, they reveal like something that hasn't been healed when we were kids. And oftentimes you can trace it back to like a specific memory or a specific phase in your life. And then like, I love that exercise of you, like going back to your, that child mm -hmm. self and, and like hugging her and crying with her. I think that's beautiful. And it, it actually does work. It's like, you, now you're an adult, you're able to like emotionally process that for her. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like at the time she didn't have the tools. She yep. didn't understand what was going on. She didn't know her options. But as an adult, you have so many, you just have more knowledge, more tools, and you can go back and you can reprocess those, those memories. And it's not like a one-time thing where it's like, it's over, but it's, it's a constant like you have to work through it kind of thing. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. That's exactly the premise of IFS. And the founder, Robert Schwartz, I believe, um, he wrote this book called No Bad Parts, where um, he talks about how to, you know, revisit those those um, inner children and, and meet them with the eight C's, I believe, and one of it is compassion, curiosity, and all of that. And so the whole point is to, lead yourself, lead your in, inner children um, in a way that allows them to trust you uh, to lead um, because it's, they don't disappear. Like our, our trauma doesn't go away. It just gets reprocessed. Um, and so your inner children, the ones who have kind of formed and, and, and are sitting in the back of your psyche, they never really leave. But what they can do is work together as like this internal family system where um, you are the leader yourself, the one who is curious, Christ-like, compassionate, uh, all of that, leading this family of all the children who were hurt in the past <laughs> towards a life that is um, protected or relatively protected and um, relatively safer and um, more secure. Yeah. Yeah. I also like how you mentioned that trauma, it doesn't go, it, it doesn't disappear. Like that experience will always be in the past, but you reprocess it. Meaning you can see it from like a new lens. It's all about just seeing things from a new perspective, a new lens with more context. And I, I don't know, because you can't go back in time, literally tra time travel to change the past. You can never change what happened. And I think a lot of people hold on to like wanting to change what happened or wanting that to not be a part of their story. But the best thing you can do is just change how you think about it. For sure. And I think a lot of CBT or talk therapy does that. Um, and I feel like the one thing I learned is that you can't force yourself to think positive thoughts if you, if, you know, the trauma is just lodged in your body. It's simply, you can't do that no matter how hard you try or how many years of talk therapy you go through. You literally have to reprocess that memory in order to make it, you know, to kind of take the power away from it. And so I feel like a lot of efforts think positively fail because we don't have that innate feeling of security, um, you know, to rely on. And so, yeah, you have to look, you have to be like, it, it takes courage, but you have to look at the trauma. You have to work with it, deal with it, understand it. It's not about like positive thinking positive is just like a band aid. Like you can't be truly positive until you work through the, the shadows and the, 
the uncomfortable, very, very, you know, like the ugly stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's painful. It's really mm-hmm. painful, but mm-hmm. oh man, the, it's like this analogy of having really good corn beyond the scarecrow, right? Yeah. To get through the scarecrow, but know that the I've reward. I've never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I know not a lot of people heard it because it's from my old pastor. Nobody oh. says it. <laughs> but I don't know. It was so like, it like stuck with me because okay. I'm like, oh yes, yeah, corn. And yeah. I, I grew corn. Um, but yeah, like there, once you get through like the phase of it being so scary and like, <laughs> exposing yourself to it again, um, in a controlled environment, know that beyond that is the life that you've always wanted. Like it is so worth, you know, processing. It's worth that journey and the difficulty of it. For sure. Yeah. (laughs) All right. And so now tell me, what are you excited about in your life now? Like what, what's next for you? Oh, wow. Now that the book is out and it is out of my hands and I hope more people would read it, but I have no control over that. I guess I'm going to write another book. (laughs) I'm not sure if I'm allowed to like say this, but what is the um, next book about? I'm still formulating ideas, but it's definitely going to involve gardening um, as kind of a central theme because that is near and dear to my heart. Um, but yeah, I, I can't wait to share more about that once it's more fleshed out, but yes. <laughs> okay, so another book and then another book. <laughs> <laughs> That's exciting. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's, I mean, in terms of like your online persona and your platforms, where, like, what do you hope to do with them? Cause I, yeah. yeah. What's your, what's your goal or your plan right now? Yeah, I mean, you would know, but um, social media is never a means to an end. And as a creator, you're constantly thinking of the next step. And I feel like at this point, I think my greatest contribution might be to find ways to share the post-traumatic wisdom that I have. So whichever platform or outlet that best, you know, facilitates that, I'll be, you know, trying to master. But I think my dream dream is to... um, make over the homes of low income families. Oh, that's so, beautiful. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I mean, we've all been there as like children of immigrants. Um, and I think back on those times where I had to move into really unlikely spaces, like someone's garage or, you know, back house, how much nicer and more, um, settling would it have been if someone were to make it a more livable space for me and my family? So I really want to make a difference in that way. Mm, I love that. What like would that, happen? <laughs> that just gives me goosebumps just listening to you speak about that because it's so beautiful and it tight like it it makes so much sense with your story and your life. And Aww. now I think I understand why you make these like you make content <laughs> about creating beautiful spaces and creating a home is because you had such a I guess unstable home life growing up. So I think that's beautiful. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Do you have any advice for others listening who are going through like trying to heal their trauma? I know it's like a big topic, but like what advice do you want to leave listeners with today? Actually, can I read a direct quote from the book? I feel like it's just sums up the whole book perfectly. And I would say you are not doomed to a miserable life because of your painful past. There is still hope for you no matter what you did or what has been done to you. And I truly hope that Forever Home can be your greatest ally on your journey of healing. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. And on top of that, do you have any final words to people listening who who follow you and love the content that you create? Final words. I mean, I guess just thank you. (laughs) Thank you so Mm -hmm. much for having an open heart and open mind to my reflections and I guess meeting me with such gentleness and love while I share very vulnerable memories. And I feel like we really are all in it together and we're all walking together, me and this online community. Um, I cannot wait to see how God will change your life over the years. Yeah. I uh, thank you for that. Um I just think it's so beautiful just 
whenever somebody shares their journey, it just inspires and gives to the people following as well. So like, I just say that to remind people listening, like everything that you're going through, no matter how difficult, how ugly it's like, there's going to be something beautiful out of it once you get through it. Right. Whether it gives you something to like impart wisdom on someone else or, or it changes you and makes you stronger. There's always, always something good that comes out of it. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Lastly, Anne, where can we find you online? Uh, you can find me on all the socials at girl and the word. Um, and I also have this cozy online shop where I sell my ceramics and jumpsuits and things called the Huga shop. So yes, girl and the word and the Huga shop. <laughs> okay. Amazing. We'll link that down below. Definitely check her out and her shop. Thank you so much. And for being here today, I appreciate you. I'm so proud of you. And Aww. I think everything that you create is just so beautiful. And I, I love that there's just this perfect purpose behind it. Mm -hmm. And and in knowing your story, it just makes it even more meaningful. So thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you for creating spaces for women like me. And I, you have been authentic ever since I've known you. And I am so honored to be part of your community. Thank you. 